And joining us today for the pundits is Audrey Dutton of the Idaho Statesman, Dr. Stephanie Witt of Boise State University, James Dawson of Boise State Public Radio, and Seth O'Gilvie of Idaho Reports. Audrey, I wanted to start with you. We talked a lot about the administrative side of expanding Medicaid and what's next, but you pointed out that there might be some legal vulnerabilities with the proposed law. What did you find? There are several places where uh, there could be, Medicaid expansion could be open to lawsuits. So I talked with the National Health Law Program and uh, former Chief Justice of the Idaho Supreme Court, Jim Jones, about what kind of they saw when they looked at the proposal. This was prior to it passing. Um, and they found a few different areas, um, such as potentially having co-pays on Medicaid if you don't comply with work requirements, the work requirements themselves, having some people go into private insurance, and then the provision that uh, sort of everyone on Medicaid expansion will be routed into certain types of care models, and then for family planning, they would have to get referrals to leave. And what are the similarities between this setup and setups in other states that have faced legal challenges? Well, what we've seen so far is uh, there are three lawsuits right now, well, two that have been decided, um, one against New Hampshire that hasn't yet, uh, Kentucky and Arkansas, of course, were decided um, last month in the middle of considering work requirements. It was during the meeting in the Senate Health and Welfare right. hearing. It that was, was wild. Yeah, absolutely. One of, one of yeah. the most dramatic times I think <laughs> the other legislature yeah. in a long time. <laughs> right, yeah. Exactly. I mean, did that seem to give anybody pause during this discussion? Oh, I mean, it definitely did because you had someone who I believe was speaking for a hospital group in uh, 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 near Burley, if I remember right, uh, go up there. He said, I had this whole speech planned out, but I just want to let you know with his phone in front of him uh, that uh, uh, a federal judge has ruled that these work requirements against, uh, well, from Kentucky and Arkansas have been deemed illegal. You had lobbyists behind the scenes frantically emailing yes. lobby or legislators that are yeah. on the dais. You could see everyone looking down at their yeah. computers <laughs> going like, what do we do at this point? Uh, I was joking that if you were a script writer trying to put together a dramatic committee hearing, yes. like I don't, if you wrote that, people would think, no way that could happen. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, that time is too perfect. Well, and they were all looking to see if Betsy had updated her blog. Right, exactly. <laughs> right, exactly. And so, Audrey, what are the similarities between Arkansas and Kentucky and what's proposed in Idaho? Well, we have a work requirements set up um, that uh, doesn't have, well, we d aren't really sure yet if it has a work training, job training requirement. That's sort of unclear. Um, My but understanding was that they, they had it kind of in the bill, but they didn't fund it, so we're not completely sure if it exists, but they could conceivably go over to some of the work training that they already have in Idaho. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, There's a whole lot of it's who nebulous. knows. Yeah. Well, and, and it's yeah. clear that there are still a lot of unanswered questions, but at the end of the day, did it seem like after this all shook out that any of that information gave lawmakers pause when they were considering whether or not to pass this bill? I mean, I think it did. Um, Van der Wouda said after, after it passed, th these are some of the most compassionate work requirements that have been put forward. Um, you're not booted permanently. It's every six months that you have to report. Um, of course, there are people who consider any work requirements to be not compassionate. Mm -hmm. um, well, and, and if you get booted off, you can get accepted back into Medicaid the very next day if you prove that you are working 20 hours a week. It's, it's an automatic, um, it's an automatic re-entry into the program. Or but two months, depending on what comes first. Well, that's the yeah. thing. Can you prove that, you know, you might suddenly uh, be work, are, are working 20 hours a week? Uh, well, and, and if it came down to a paperwork error, I guess, yes. that's, that's what it would, you know, that's where that situation, mm -hmm. I think, would so come in. But it might not be as immediate as they said it would. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And right. sometimes it takes a little while for those paychecks to catch up. A lot of mm -hmm. places work two weeks right. after, like you don't get the pay stubs. Sometimes it's electronic, you have to print it off, you have to prove that this is a real uh, pay stub. What if you're a private contractor who's just working with, you know, like a roo you're doing roofs for people in your neighborhood. You might not have a real good right. ledger of what your work is. But when we asked the director yesterday on Thursday, he said a lot of that would be up to rule promulgation in the Department of Health and Welfare, assuming that we still have administrative rules next yes. year when <laughs> Medicaid yes. goes uh, into uh. effect. But but there is still so many unanswered questions that it's, it's going to be up to the Department of Health and Welfare to promulgate these rules. Well, that's how we do everything, right? right. The, 
the legislature says, let's have a program to do whatever, and then the agencies have to flesh out exactly what that will mean, what the timelines and requirements, and if there are fees, what those might look like. So that's part of the normal implementation process, which appears to be off the rails for us right now. So uh, the status of all of those administrative rules are, are up in the air. And, and I just want to make the point that um, while the fight about should they be there and all that is kind of inside baseball, right? The Senate versus the House and, and turf and all that. That is so uninteresting to the normal <laughs> citizen, you know? And there's an enormous inefficiency here in terms of guiding the thousands of people who work for these agencies and which rules are in place, which ones are in jeopardy, and should we go with the new ones, or can we? And I, it's just irresponsible in my mind to leave that all vague like this. Well, but James Witt, and I were just talking earlier today about how hard it is to explain to people how important these administrative <laughs> rules are. It's yeah. so incredibly boring and <laughs> mundane, and but so critical to the lives of daily Idahoans, or the daily lives of Idahoans, rather. Yeah, I mean, when you say administrative rules, people's eyes roll back in their heads. They, they just don't understand what necessarily is involved with the rulemaking process or what these rules are at all, whether it's you know school curriculum or uh, you know for example state park fees like we were talking right. about. So it's it's just the most important thing probably that has happened this legislative session, but no one really knows about it. it it's boring, but it, it is this huge turf turf war. I mean, there, there's got to be Game of Thrones metaphors that you could put out there to apply to these things, like who will get the crown of getting to set the actual standards <laughs> of Idaho uh, <laughs> statute here? Because, I mean, that's what's at stake. Pretty much all, like, what, 8,000 some odd pages of yeah. Idaho statute that governs almost yeah. every aspect of a citizen's life here in the state of Idaho. That's what's at stake. I mean, there's got to be someone with a dragon that can ride it and solve this fight. <laughs> so, so I want to bring the conversation back to Medicaid for a second. How problematic is it to have the process up in the air while the Department of Health and Welfare is trying to figure out what to do with these waivers and how to promulgate these rules? Well, there, there is kind of a weird irony there that the Department of Health and Welfare is going to have to go through and through the administrative rules setting make sense of this, this new Medicaid sideboards bill that they just uh, passed at the same time as they just got all of their rules thrown out by the legislature who has to pretty much make sense of it for them. They're also going to go through the waiver process and the department will go through and kind of give like this is what they actually meant by this legislature and ask for that from the, uh, the, the federal government. So there's a couple things that they will clear up like I was really curious how Department of Corrections would work into this. The director said no like don't worry and the waiver process will make it pretty uh, clear that these folks are exempt from the work requirement. And they'll go through and kind of, I guess, uh, turn this idea that the ledger legislature had into a reality. There were also some kind of lingering questions about how long it would take Idaho to no longer need the catastrophic health care fund and the indigent mm -hmm. health care fund. Mm -hmm. you know, we still gave money to those funds this year. The legislature did. Right. But right. the idea is that we won't need the, those as much once Medicaid is fully expanded. Well, I guess that's the hope, but um, I don't know how long that's going to take to get everyone processed onto uh, the expanded Medicaid. It, th I assume there are people who could opt not to join the exchange, and then they remain vulnerable uh, without coverage, right, if they're in that income range and they don't opt into the... So uh, they would need to opt into Medicaid. Yes. Or they would be on the exchange. Right. Right. And there are some big differences between private insurance, what you'd find on the exchange, and what you would get as a Medicaid recipient. Mm -hmm. You've looked into this, Audrey. Yeah. There are huge differences between med what Medicaid covers and what private insurance covers, what it costs. Um, there was some discussion about having to create a new plan to put on your Health Idaho, Idaho's insurance exchange. Um, and I don't know where that landed. but mm -hmm. uh, so. Private insurance covers some things that Medicaid doesn't. Medicaid covers some things that private insurance doesn't. Private insurance, obviously, you have premiums, you have copays, you have deductibles. Um, it's unclear, you know, what what kind of guidance people would be getting as they're trying to decide whether to opt into Medicaid. I think that'll be pretty important. Mm -hmm. And once again, up to the Department of Health and Welfare, I right. imagine. Right. And yeah. I know that at one point there were ACA guidelines <coughs> on what those plans had to look like if those people 
would qualify for the Medicaid expansion and you did it, but they were still on an exchange. There were some set guidelines out there. But then again, the Trump administration is granting waivers left and right by for all sorts of things that we may not have expected before. And I think it, this is just going to be kind of a, a journey of discovery over the next year. Yeah. Because yeah. as the director said, January 1st, clean Medicaid expansion. Maybe March, waivers. Maybe after that, lawsuit. Maybe judge puts stay. All of a sudden you're into November where you might have a new president that thinks entirely different about it. Or maybe you have an entirely Republican uh, federal government again and they just get rid of the ACA altogether. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there could be just a rocky road for the next year. And I think it's entirely possible that everything we're talking about right now just ends up getting tossed and we have straight Medicaid expansion mm -hmm. and it just was a really long, mm -hmm. <laughs> long road to get mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And expensive, too. Mm. I, I, I wanted to ask um, about the, the interim. You know, we still have several months before, regardless of what happens with the waivers, before Medicaid expansion goes into effect. What happens with the people who need health care now? Is that where the catastrophic health care fund comes in? I would assume that they would still be able to, um, to get help from that program, uh, that the counties would, who would absorb those indigent health care costs. Or the hospitals. Right. Right. And I'd be remiss not to uh, discuss that transmittal letter that the governor wrote in uh, w while approving, while signing the Medicaid expansion bill. What stood out to me about that was it read exactly like a veto letter. The governor laid out all of his problems that he had with the bill, and then he signed it anyway. Yeah, not to mention the fact that it was labeled as a veto <laughs> initially on the website for about 15, 20 minutes, yeah. uh, which was very confusing for all of us who had heard that he had actually signed it down in the press room. Um, so. I don't know, he, he just laid out all of these concerns that we've just talked about here as to whether the waivers are gonna get implemented. Um, he specifically hit on the lack of a, a work training program that he really wanted to see in um, this this uh, this bill, but uh, he still signed it anyway, said he hopes that uh, they can work on it next year, and basically. Not to, not to mention a few days before, he laid out the exact argument for videoing the bill in his veto of the initiatives bill, where he said right. that liberal Ninth Circuit court they're just going to throw this out or put a say on it. Well, I think that also applies to the uh, to the work requirements on the um, uh, Medicaid expansion. Depending on who bill. sues who. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, obviously someone will have to find standing, so we don't know if they'll have to wait until these things actually are implemented before they can sue. Yeah. But I'm not a lawyer, so. And he did, but he did praise the legislature for coming up with, I think he said, an innovative approach to Medicaid expansion. And an Idaho solution, which right. we've heard used for almost every attempt to deal with Medicaid expansion <laughs> over the last six years, too. Yeah. Is there anything innovative in here that we haven't seen in other states? <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I mean, together, yeah, there's a lot in this it's the whole picture. Policy, <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> well, what about the uh, the family planning waiver? Uh, that was something that kind of stood out to me. Uh, I didn't know that other states might have that. Have you seen that anywhere else? I don't think so. And it also was one where I was not sure where, like, what the goal was, um, and I'm still not. Uh, I could understand kind of where the other policies were coming from, but I didn't really understand why they would want to. Well, if and what is the goal? Planning. Well, if you're what cynical, I mean, you can very much point to they're trying to c prevent money from going to Planned Parenthood. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that mm -hmm. seems like the cynical political thing that's going on. There might be other reasons for it. You heard a lot about keeping um, health cares within the home, and that will cut down on costs. But again, when you normally go out of the home for family planning, you're going to Planned Parenthood, and they are one of the cheapest providers of those services that is offered across the country. So it's hard to see that the, there'd be cost savings. I think they just don't want them going there. Well, with both the, the potential job training uh, component of the Medicaid expansion and this requirement to be referred outside for uh, family planning, it, the first thing that comes to my mind is how accessible are those kinds of services outside of this 50 mile radius, right? If I'm in Chalice or Grangeville or or Genesee or something, you know, how realistic is that? That we're they're just a finding a doctor's hard. Yeah. Well, yes, mm -hmm. and so the one I found is not suitable anymore because now I have to go find another one, mm -hmm. you know, which is I don't know. I read that as just like let's delay the uh, onset of appropriate um, pregnancy counseling till you're 
too pregnant to terminate the preg pregnancy. Like, let's make it harder. You have to go find another doctor and I don't know. And that's actually one of the pieces that I think is most, I mean, legally, maybe this is gonna be a lawsuit because Medicaid covers so many women and is seen as so critical for, uh, for women's health that there are special rules. You have to provide family planning services and supplies and you cannot make them hard to access. This is a federal rule. So in this case, are we violating that by making women go to their doctor and get a referral to go wherever they want to go. I also want to point out that there aren't a whole lot of Planned Parenthood clinics in Idaho. No. Three, right, if right. I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. right. Well, and then uh, bringing it back to the rural component, I mean, uh, sometimes doctors maybe don't want to give those referrals. Is that also a component? Right. Yeah. I, I think that you'd have to have a referral. And then also talking about cost, after reading your column on your pregnancy, I can't imagine that some family planning is remotely as expensive as actually giving birth to a child. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My baby was very expensive. <laughs> I, I wanted to get back to that rules discussion and how unprecedented this was because as we said, this is a mundane process mm -hmm. and it seemed to be much more about politics and this push and pull between the House and the Senate and the executive branch than it was about the rules themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, there are thousands of pages of rules and each year there are maybe another thousand new ones to look at and review and they're really only, uh, it, the pattern appears to be that the House is objecting to maybe eight or ten percent of those so it's not as if the entire body of the rules are, are um, being contested by the House. But the House, which is more conservative than the Senate, wants to go after some of those and, and some of the fee structures and so on. And, and um, the Senate is not concurring with them, so they're not getting rid of the rules that they don't like, and this is a way to try to recapture that power. Well, it was one of the first times that I saw the Senate really put its foot in the ground this year, to be honest. I mean, the House was pretty hard charging for most of the year. That was kind of the overall theme that mm -hmm. I saw, whether it was um, initiatives or uh, several other bills. Um, and Senator Winder, for the you know, yeah. first time that I heard, he said, no, we're not going to take this yeah. up. This is what we're going to do to protect our constitutional right to uh, promulgate rules. Mm -hmm. But it since it's March Madness, like the, the Senate kind of went up there to take a charge. Yeah. Uh, the House went up and dunked on top of them because <laughs> they tried to recreate that bill and they just said, yeah. hey, we can get what we want by just voting it down. And I think in the, the, the gamble that the Senate was taking, the House definitely won. But I mean, did they they win? took them to the House. But, th but did they win? Because at the end of the day, what to do with these rules is completely up to the executive branch and Governor Little. And that House, the legislature as a whole, has worked so hard for so many years to center more power in the legislature. Oh, absolutely. And the House, barring a special session where the governor forces them to come back and deal with this before which is a possibility. July 1st, which they'd yeah. have to, and probably significantly before July 1st because they got to get all that yeah. process done, the House will, for all these temporary rules, get to veto a lot of them, like they wanted to do, like the initial amendment that they put on that bill was. So they kind of got their way unless there's a special session. Uh, I think there's some some irony or there's a disconnect to the situation that we're at here in Idaho because a lot of the, the way in which the Republican Party has been working here in Idaho has been vesting power continuously with HDR 5, with the push of the legislature into the legislative branch and taking that power away from the administrative branch. Conversely, at the federal level, you see the federal or the uh, National Republican Party pushing all of that power into the administrative branch, pushing it to Trump, taking it away from the legislature, taking it away from the court system. And I just think that it's, it's odd to see the, the same party trying to vest very different institutions with that power. Mm. Yeah, I wanted to get your thoughts on that, Dr. White. Well, I think that there's not one Republican Party, there are 50. You know, <laughs> each state has its own uh, you know, it's a federated system in the national in the party structures, right? One so could argue there's a couple of different ones here. Now. <laughs> yeah, yes. right. Uh, maybe one in the House, one <laughs> in the Senate, and and so I think there's a lot of um, variation across the country in terms of what what the party means and what it wants, and and of course we're talking about an enormous supermajority here of Republicans in the legislature, so. Uh, it's kind of infighting within the party uh, more than they're fighting with the Democrats. So 
Um, I, I don't know that there's any global principle driving this as much as uh, it's just uh, opportunity. You know, this is something we want, so we're going to get it. W one final thing about that. I, I think it's normal for the, um, the um, chambers to fight for, with each other, and I think it's normal for the branches to fight back and forth. That's kind of the intent, right? You know, ambition be made to counteract ambition, like Madison said. So, <laughs> you know, that we, we kind of meant them to be co-equal branches. Um, well, what if just one body is fighting, though? The other are all trying to <laughs> deal with them. I yeah. Th <laughs> but that tension is absolutely built in. So uh, what are the odds that Governor Little calls a special ses session and says, come back here and fix it? <sighs> You know, <laughs> this is my first year covering the legislature, so. <laughs> so you it's know. It's, yeah, right. It's, all, it's also Governor Little's first <laughs> day in the governor's office. <laughs> it, so. It's true, but I mean, if, if, I don't know, I think he sent a s pretty strong message with his veto on the initiatives bill, but if he doesn't necessarily do anything on this, then I mean, it, it, it kind of seems like he'd be ceding power more toward the legislative branch uh, than if he just did nothing. One last thing before uh, we go. We have about two minutes left. We've talked a lot about rules, a lot about what did get done. There were some big things that didn't get done. We hit on mm -hmm. the public school funding formula earlier in the show, but um, anything hemp related? Uh, plenty, plenty hemp related. I mean, it, it still seems like it's going to be illegal for um, someone in Oregon who's raising hemp to ship that across Idaho. They're going to have to go around it <laughs> to get to Colorado or wherever their processor might be. Um, there was also the mandatory minimum sentencing uh, that got killed in the Senate uh, yet again this year after it passed the House overwhelmingly. Plenty of stuff left undone. M Marcy's well, law. Marcy's law. Mm -hmm. um, the third year in a row that it didn't go anywhere, second year in a row. You also had no ta large tax cut this year. That's normally mm -hmm. something that the Idaho legislature just does because we do it. Um, you saw no movement for uh, another year on add the words. Not even, I mean, that bill was introduced, but nothing kind of came of it. And a lot of these big issues that we talk about pretty much all year and take a stab at, I think everything took a backseat to that Medicaid expansion and the initiatives bill that definitely sucked a lot of the ambition to go forward out of the legislature and didn't exactly make people want to compromise. We really didn't see anything meaningful on transportation this right. year or that's funding right. as a whole, and that's something that's major statewide and for these rural communities. Well, we just have such a big hole that, we're tr that we've dug. You know, we are so far behind on yearly maintenance, and eventually the roads will become dangerous and the bridges will become dangerous and so some of them arguably already well, are yeah. yes driving to moscow like yeah. i well, can tell you uh, <laughs> if, if you could drive yeah. to moscow right now you know. how much is the flooding going to exacerbate that situation well i I, I mean, I'm not a civil engineer, but my guess is a lot. Uh, you know, <laughs> there's still a lot assumption. of uh, moisture up in the mountains, and and you know when that when those come down through those narrow uh, roadbed canyon kinds of situations, you're gonna have you're gonna have some uh, normal uh, wear. And really down. out on a limb, natural disaster, bad. Yes. <laughs> yes. Seth O'Gilby with his hot takes. Thanks, <laughs> James Dawson, Audrey Dutton, Dr. Stephanie Witt. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.